It's uh, delightful to see all of you here. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new friends as well. I'd like to welcome everybody to the 15th annual fall conference of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. The mission of the Center for Ethics and Culture is to share the, and explore the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, and dialogue across a variety of disciplines at the highest level. And through our efforts, we aim to promote the flourishing of Notre Dame's Catholic mission on campus for students, faculty, staff, leadership, and alumni and friends of the university. Off campus, we seek to project Notre Dame's voice into the most important conversations taking place both in elite academia uh, and the public square, both here in the United States and abroad. In everything we do, we seek, as Notre Dame does, to serve the church. Now, we believe that the fall conference, since its inception by my predecessor, David Solomon, in 2001, is a clear embodiment of our aspirations. For those of you uh, who have been here before, and I'm grateful to see so many old friends, and friendship is such an important part of this event, um, you know that our tradition is to take a very broad theme and to engage it from numerous disciplines and points of view, but always taking as our fundamental point of departure the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition. And this year, our theme, Your Light Shall Rise in the Darkness, Responding to the Cry of the Poor, is inspired by the pontificate of Pope Francis. And for those of you who are at Mass, we're very grateful and humbled to have received a papal greeting and a blessing from Pope Francis uh, 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 for our 15th annual conference. Uh, it was conveyed to Bishop Rhodes this morning, who announced it uh, at the Mass. Um, over the next two and a half days, we're honored to hear from and engage in conversation with 80 luminaries from a host of disciplines from around the world on how to think rightly about poverty and how to care for the poor. Our keynote speakers this year, of course, are Nobel laureate in economics, Professor James Heckman, whom you'll hear from momentarily, of the University of Chicago, Gerhard Cardinal Mueller, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith of the Catholic Church, as well as our two uh, fellows and fellow emeritus of the Center for Ethics and Culture, John Finnis and Alistair McIntyre. I should mention that at 10 p.m. this evening, there will be a showing of the documentary, The Rule, uh, about St. Benedict's Prep in Newark, New Jersey, uh, with an opportunity to meet the producers and discuss the film. This will take place in the Browning Theater of the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. And for those of you who don't have tickets, who would like tickets, you can pick them up at the same desk where you registered. There are plenty of tickets left. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, all of the people whose hard work made this event possible, including Harriet Baldwin, Bill Evans, all of our Soren Fellows of the Center for Ethics and Culture, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, our medical ethics intern, Laura Nash, Father John Paul Kimes of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and also he is also our new uh, inaugural Pena Four Fellow in Canon Law at the Center for Ethics and Culture. Uh, our amazing staff, Ryan Madison, my associate director, Margaret Cabanis, our director of publications, Stephen Fredoso, our communications director, Tracy Westlake, our administrative assistant, and in particular, our event planner, program manager, and culture of life programming coordinator, Deb McGuigan. As always, we'd like to acknowledge the generos generosity of our loyal benefactors, including both the Mays family and the DeNicola family. And, uh, I'd like to turn the, uh, and I'd like to point out that the staff, uh, ha including myself, have a blue ribbon on our name tags and are available to help you uh, if, if you need assistance. We have book publishers and presenters in rooms 100 to 104. Um, and I would urge all of you to, wear, to, to get your name tags and wear them to the meals. Um, and uh, with those admin that administrative housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to turn the program over to Professor Bill Evans, who is both a Keogh Hesburgh uh, University professor here at, at Notre Dame. He is also the chairman of the Department of Economics, who will introduce our speaker and our respondent. So welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, for coming. Uh, this is a very special evening for us here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have as our keynote speaker Jim Heckman, the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Jim is a labor economist and his work has moved the frontier on how empirical research is done in economics. He has worked on some of the most important topics in the social sciences and he has devoted his research 
to understanding the circumstances that allow people to flourish in today's economy. He may be the most celebrated economist in the past half century. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He has won every major academic prize in economics, including the Frisch Prize, the John Bates Clark Award, and the 2000 Nobel Prize in Economics. Along with his research, Jim has left a number of important legacies in the profession. I'm going to note just two here tonight. Um, first, Jim has been the primary dissertation advisor on 64 dissertations, and his former students are now tenured at the leading uni uh, universities in the world, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Cornell, Michigan, Penn, CMU, Wisconsin, just to name a few. Jim has no peer in economics and his success in advising students. Second, James Brown might be the hardest working man in rock and roll, but Jim Heckman is certainly the hardest working man in academics. Uh, it's uh, in academics when people are at Jim's stature and they win major prizes, they have a tendency to do things like uh, start blogs or uh, star in commercials or uh, hang out with George Soros. Um, but uh, Jim is the consummate academic and uh, there's actually some data on this. Um, my colleague Kirk Duran has this fascinating paper about what happens uh, to people in mathematics when they win the Frisch Prize. The, uh, the, the Fields Medal. The Fields Medal was the dis most distinguished prize in mathematics, and uh, Kirk has a paper with one of uh, Jim's former students, George Borjas, uh, and they take a look at what happens to productivity after they win. Uh, on this graph, the x-axis is the years before and after they win the Frisch Prize. Uh, there are contenders who've won major prizes in mathematics, uh, and then there are the medalists themselves, and you see that their productivity just declines precipitously after they win. Uh, this is a graph of Jim's productivity through 1999 before he won the Nobel Prize, and this is what happens after he wins it. So one of the most productive people in our profession has gotten more productive after he won the Nobel Prize. So uh, without further ado, I'd like, to meet, uh, I'd like you to meet our uh, featured speaker, Jim Heckman from the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think uh, it partly depends on work, what you mean by work. A lot of what I do is called work by some, but I consider it pleasure. It's a great opportunity. And I must say, after winning the Nobel Prize, I had a chance to meet an even broader and very distinguished group of people. So I was actually able to, to do more, more of what I love to do, which sometimes is called work. But anyway, I'm very pleased to be here today, to be invited to talk to this group uh, in, the, in the 15th Annual Center for Ethics and Cultural uh, uh, Policy. And uh, I am very interested in the particular issue of poverty, which you've talked about today. And so I want to try to address this question. And I have some uh, presentation that I'm going to go through today and uh, discuss it. And I understand we're going to have some questions and answers. And I'm also happy to take questions in the course of the, of the presentation. So uh, we can make it. It's, even though it's a large group, I'm very happy to encourage uh, discussion and challenge. Uh, it's the kind of tradition. So let me just talk about this question of poverty, which is, of course, central in much of the political discussion and social discussion. There's a lot of concern about inequality, social mobility, and inclusion. And this graph, uh, which is basically the, the 99 versus the 1% uh, graph, which gained a lot of attention, put out by the Congressional Budget Office, uh, finds substantial effects where we look at households, these are family units now, substantial income gains for those at the very top of the income distribution. And there are many different ways to measure this. Uh, and I think, uh, nonetheless, all different ways point to the fact there's greater inequality. But there's also been another, even maybe more ominous, what some people might consider sinister relationship between this kind of inequality in income among households and the concept of social mobility. What the next generation will be like. How important is the accident of birth for one's current, uh, uh, for, 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 for the uh, future? Uh, how much is one tied to family origins? And um, what we found, and what has been found in the literature, I should say, uh, 
has been that social mobility, where we mean the importance of the family background and affecting the next generation's uh, economic and social chances, that there's a lot of stagnation and that in fact uh, we find that there's a lot of immobility and persistence of inequality across generations. So a measure that many economists and social scientists have used is a so-called intergenerational income coefficient. And here I'll just put this up as a graph. Uh, I'm an economist, so I like to use numbers. Probably be more numbers than you want to hear, but nonetheless, I'll try to, uh, or see, I'll put them up. And this is a graph that plots uh, two things. There's a relationship that talks about the income in a current generation, the children, and the income of the parents. And so in a, in a society that might be called a very equal society, the beta would be zero. There would be no relationship between what the parents earned or what the parents' position was and what the children's position was. And in a society that was very unequal, there'd be very high value of beta. And you can see, I don't know if you can quite see the graph, uh, you can see the position of various countries around the world. Uh, Denmark is one where if you look at the intergenerational mobility, which is graphed here, you can see that there's a very high degree of mobility. The family income, this beta, which is graphed here, is actually very relatively low. If you look, for example, at what the, where the US is, the UK, we're pretty high in terms of immobility. But what's also interesting in this graph, and this is a graph that has attracted a lot of attention, is that the values of this beta, which are a measure of immobility, are also dependent on the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality in the, in the society. And so this is a curve that actually uh, has been called the Gatsby curve. Alan Kruger, when he was uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration, uh, coined it the Gatsby curve uh, after the, the novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald. But basically showing there's a strong relationship between this intergenerational mobility and the amount of income inequality of the family at a point in time. And so there is a lot of inequality and a lot of inequality in the future mobility. So it looks like current prospects are affecting future uh, outcomes. Uh, and there's, so there's a close relationship between this cross-sectional income inequality and intergenerational income mobility. But the question is, how do we interpret this relationship? Some people could argue it goes one way, it goes the other way. We can say, well, family income and family resources have an effect, and they certainly have an effect uh, in terms of financing and providing opportunities to children. But it could also be that the transmission of values, the transmission of culture, as well as the financial wealth of the family affects the, the assets, the, the skills that the next generation acquire. And therefore, it's not just a matter of income inequality, it's a matter of what else is going on in the family. So it's that, that this, this mechanism of family transfer beta is still somewhat of a mystery and I think plays an important role, though, in our understanding and as a target for public policy. Now, if we look at other measures of inequality, I'll come back to this graph, although I won't actually show it again. I'll come back to its interpretation. But if you look at other measures of the same kind of phenomenon, we ask who goes to college? Who goes to any kind of college? Not just four-year colleges, not just top colleges like Notre Dame, but we're talking about anybody going to college. And we can see a very sharp disparity across family income. So for example, at the bottom 10% of the distribution, we actually see, bottom 20% of the distribution, what we see is basically only 11% of the kids are going to some kind of uh, post-secondary degree completion, associate degree, community college. And of course, at the top of the income distribution, you're getting close to 53%. So there's substantial disparities. And this, again, is a source of much uh, debate and uh, concern. And if you look, for example, at another measure of poverty, which I think in some sense is the most ominous, if you look at children under six living in low-income families, uh, you can see that there's actually been an increase over time, that we're getting close to 48% of all children under six are living in what you could see as low-income families. So this is a, a, a case where children, so if you look at those gradients, we're seeing in more and more children growing up in low-income families, and they're not offered much of, of an opportunity, and the families simply don't provide at least the resources, the material resources. So what do we do about this problem? I understand the conference this year is about exactly this question. 
And so I think there's a very traditional approach. And it's not just in the Catholic Church. It's not just in any religious church. But I think the traditional church, and I'm using a, a somewhat religious description or, or a biblical description, is to give alms to the poor. Redistribution is an important part of the modern welfare state. And I think uh, this, of course, has strong biblical foundations. So for example, if we go back to the Old Testament, we can see that you know, the notion that there will always be poor people with us is an important part of the Bible. And also the important command that's written here is to suggest that people be open-handed toward brothers and towards the poor. And as has already been stated, Pope Francis has actually also uh, emphasized this in the last few years, in the, in, his, in the early years of his papacy, that a way has to be found to enable benefits uh, to, uh, to be able to benefit from the fruits of the earth and to basically talk about inclusion, not just in terms of material resources, but in terms of justice, fairness, and individual dignity. And I can give a lot of other quotations. It's not my comparative advantage, especially in this audience, to be quoting from the Bible or from the Pope. <laughs> but nonetheless, I will just cite these things which are very familiar, I think, to many of you, is, uh, is the call to responsibility. Uh, in which individuals should really think about uh, inequality and social justice. And I want to address that question because I think it's a very important question. And of course, there are a lot of biblical precedents. I won't read the Bible for you. Many of you are more, much more conversant in doing this. But we look at Proverbs. We also see a kind of promise, uh, which I, I know understand is quite controversial in its own statement, that one gives freely and yet gains more. So there's even a hope, maybe, that on, a, on a point of view of maybe even personal gain. Um, but there's also a notion that uh, you don't want to do this too publicly, so it's not all for display. So there's a real question about what we would do in the form of the giving. But I want to raise a more narrow question. So I'm not going to be citing many more verses from the Bible. Uh, and I'm more than happy to have better quotations given to me. But there's a real issue that arises about this notion of alms to the poor. And the real question I want to talk about today is what are the effective policies to address exactly these goals of social inclusion, to reduce economic and social inequality, and to promote uh, economic and social opportunity and human dignity. And that's the, what I want to talk about. Now, much of the view in economics has had taken the, exactly the same point of view about alms to the poor. Uh, there's a work, a whole work on called optimal redistribution. And this work on optimal redistribution associated with the names of Ramsey and Murleys, very distinguished economists, has been talking about a way to redistribute resources from the rich to the poor in a way that increases the pie or doesn't distort the pie very much, that promotes, uh, in, that reduces inequality and yet is also consistent with incentives in the larger society. But this whole question about uh, 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 of redistribution has a quality about it which pits people against each other. And it's been showing up in political campaigns, not just in the United States, all around the world. I think that was one of the big issues in the Brazilian elections, actually, the rich versus the poor. So the issue that frequently is couched is the, that between equity and efficiency. Can we be fair to people or can we be economically efficient? If we tax the rich, and we tax people and we tax incentives, will we somehow discourage productivity and therefore maybe discourage the possibility of a bigger pie which could be redistributed? So there's a lot of discussion of that question in the economics literature. But I think that's a very static point of view. And I think it only considers really marginal responses, it only considers labor supply, and it only considers material resources. I think that's a very important limitation. And so what I want to talk about today is something that I think is very, symptom, very consistent, at least talking to people tonight at dinner, with certain views that might be shared here at Notre Dame, but more generally. I want to think about a dynamic strategy of a way to approach poverty and to approach intergenerational inequality, which is going to be based on the notion which I will call pre-distribution. And it essentially is not, and I shouldn't say not redistribution, because I don't want to pit redistribution against pre-distribution. What I want to pit against is the notion that only redistribution is our policy for alleviating policy. Alms to the poor, maybe, but in a certain way that we actually are do this and essentially give people skills. And I want to argue that this kind of approach that I'm going to talk about tonight 
doesn't really graze this trade-off, this traditional trade-off between equity and efficiency, or at least it diminishes it. So what I want to talk about is a strategy of giving skills to people to avoid them being poor in the first place, to improve human dignity, and to present what I think is a complementary strategy to redistribution. And what I want to talk about is a strategy that builds character, promotes family values, and creates skills. Now this sounds very touchy-feely for an economist, but it isn't. It's actually rooted very soundly in economic analysis. And what I want to argue that what is also socially fair can be viewed as economically efficient. And so in some sense, even though I come from Chicago, it's nearly what Milton Friedman said could never happen, a free lunch. Well, it isn't quite a free lunch. There are still some costs. But there is a sense in which we can actually have our cake and eat it too. I'll try to enunciate what I mean. So what am I, what am I talking about? There's a basic fact about the economy, modern economies, and even semi-modern economies. If we're talking about China, economies that are modernizing, skills are very important all around the world. And they're major determinants of inequality. This gets overlooked in a lot of recent discussions. For example, Thomas Piketty's recent book uh, about capital and the distribution of income, which is on a bestseller list for many weeks in the New York Times, overlooks completely the important role of skills in shaping inequality. And I think it's a, I mean, there are some technical errors in the work. I'm not going to go into that. But I think the importance of skills is, is really neglected. And we understand that major component of inequality is inequality in skills and the returns to skills. So what I want to talk about tonight is that skills create agency. And I mean agency in the sense of capacity for people to act and to promote the dignity of human beings. So I think it's consistent with what I was reading in the Pope's message. And then I want to think about a strategy that base, is based on creating capabilities. And by capabilities, I mean the capacities to act and to create future capacities. To be agents who can act on their own, who can actually help build their lives, who can take actions, who can work with others. And I want to try to look more deeply at what we know about these capacities and try to understand how they're created and what an effective policy would be. I want to argue if we look at those capacities and the modern understanding of those capacities, we're going to have a very different way about thinking about addressing poverty. So let me just talk about what these lessons are. I want to summarize. I first of all want to summarize some lessons which, and then give you some evidence on it. I can stop if you just want the summary of the lessons. If you just want a, a pure sermon without evidence, then I can stop very quickly. But I do have some slides on evidence. So you can tell me. Bill, you can tell me when to stop. Okay. You want the evidence. He's a very empirical economist, a good empirical economist. So the first thing is to understand something which is obvious. I think it's obvious. We talked about this at dinner. I think it's obvious here in many, many schools, uh, many Catholic schools in particular. But we really need to understand that multiple skills are useful. And I say that, that sounds a very, very heavy-handed, jargon-ridden way to say that things matter besides test scores. And in fact, we have many different people that we can cite. So for example, Emerson, more than 150 years ago, and Martin Luther King said almost exactly the same thing. In fact, they said exactly the same thing. I suspect King read Emerson, which is the character is more important than intellect. And essentially, this notion, which essentially dominated the whole common school movement in the US, has dropped out of sight in terms of public policy, even in terms of thinking about how we evaluate schools. More than IQ or scores on achievement tests, more than PISA scores, multiple skills are really very important. And I think I'm actually very encouraged, even though this sounds like a revolutionary strategy given all the emphasis on no child left behind. And if you look at the OECD reports around the world about how are the Shanghai schools doing on PISA, how are people doing on various this kind of test score or that, what we've actually understood is that a body of recent research, very hardcore empirical research, shows, and I want to show you a little of that research, that more than these pure cognitive skills that we've been fixated on the last 50 years in the, in the era of cognitive psychology, focusing exclusively on this dimension, more these character skills play a very important role. They can be measured, they're very predictive, and they can be shaped by education. I'm actually very pleased to report that I was at a conference last spring in Sao Paulo convened by the OECD. This was of education ministers. And what was it about? It was about changing the thrust of educational programs among OECD countries. 
away from PISA, focusing exclusively on achievement tests and PISA scores, to look at things like non-cognitive skills, character skills. So I want to show you some evidence that these low levels of these skills, both cognitive, cognitive skills are important, social emotional skills are very important. We need to also think though about these social and emotional skills and how we can go beyond thinking about a test driven mentality where we're only thinking about one dimension of human flourishing and in a, in a, in a, in a, in where actually many more uh, dimensions are important. So that's one important lesson I want to talk about. A second lesson that's come from the recent research, and this is data that we've collected, that I say we collectively, social scientists have collected, is that gaps in the skills between the advantage and the disadvantage open up very early in life, even before children enter school. So what we see is that children who are getting substantial gaps in educational, you know, educational, both emotional and social skills that are there at age five and six that show up later on at age 17 and 18 when kids are applying to school. And that those gaps really aren't that much alleviated or attenuated by going to school. These gaps in skills across socioeconomic groups are important and they appear uh, very early. Now, if you look at those gaps, 100 years ago, if we were here, the good scientists, the good social scientists, all the thinkers of the day, the eugenicists, would say, that's exactly genetic, right? If we actually see that there are gaps between the advantage and the disadvantage that open up early, this is basically an example of genes. Smart people have smart kids, smart people are successful, they have high earnings, they're the advantaged ones, and then we have a kind of social Darwinism. That dominated thinking. It dominated political thinking, not just in the United States, it dominated thinking about schools and, and whole social classes around the world. And what we've come to understand is that, of course, in the modern understanding of genetics and epigenetics, is that genes play a role, but they're far from the whole story. And I think that's a very important lesson. The capabilities that matter are skills. And this, I think, is different. You think about even as recently as 20 years ago, when the bell curve, a book that was published 20 years ago, was talking about the difference between blacks and whites. It was cast as basically genetically determined, that blacks were somehow dumber, and it was a genetic trait. And what that was, it, it unleashed a whole discussion, which had been in undergoing, which had been really current through much of the 20th century. And what people didn't understand was that these capabilities that matter are skills. They're acquired. They're not traits that are genetically determined. And they can be fostered by family, schools, and social interactions. And I want to try to document a bit of that. Another point I want to talk about closely related is that family nurturance and investments play a crucial role. So the family and family life is playing a very, very important role. And we all know, of course, families are under, uh, uh, under stress in, in, in many societies around the world. But I want to show you some evidence of how dramatic this family influence is. If we look, for example, at the level of words, the vocabulary of children at age three from families that are advantaged and disadvantaged, children from professional families speaking about 50% more words than children from uh, working class families and more than twice as many uh, words as kids from the very disadvantaged kids of families. And so we have to understand in a way that much public policy doesn't like to talk about is that the family lives of children are major producers of these cognitive and social and emotional skills. And that supplementing the family life and its resources in a variety of ways I'll talk about and engaging the whole life of the child are really effective social policies. And it's an anti-poverty policy. It's one that affects the future generation. And so we really have to bring the family back into public discussion. And I think precisely the understanding that these capabilities and skills that are different among families are not genetically determined. They are at least partially determined by what we can do in schools and in families. Essentially gets rid of the hot and button issues where people were talking about blaming the families. All, the, all of the uh, fanatical uh, reaction against the Moynihan report some 50 years ago came because people thought, well, this is just genetic. These families, you know, these people are dumb, they're, they're disadvantaged, and that somehow the whole notion of poverty as a genetic condition or genetically determined condition really has to be modified and we have to think much more broadly. Now, an important finding, which is, which is really has to be, uh, and I'll talk about this, is we know that nurturing family environments 
are under challenge around the world. And I'll show you some statistics on this. But what we've also come to understand is that in the life of children, and this is something we didn't know, at least I didn't know when I was in graduate school, I don't think many people knew this, even as well as we know it in the last 10 or 15 years, is that there are critical and sensitive periods in the formation of these capabilities. We actually understand the importance of the early years. And in understanding these multiple capabilities, we understand that there are sensitive periods where some skills are more easily shaped than other periods. Where, and so, for example, cognition, things like raw IQ, gets to be pretty stable by the time kids are 10 or 11. Social and emotional skills, self-discipline, self-control, those, those are skills that can be acquired later in life, into the teenage years, even into the 20s. And in fact, it's a, it's a major source of rethinking about what social policy is. So we need to think about the dynamics of skill formation, and we need to think about what are the best periods of time where we might intervene, and for what skills. And when we don't intervene early, can we actually supplement or somehow remediate? What are the most effective remediations? And I want to argue uh, that actually resilience is an important part of the human being that some of the children that growing up in some of the worst circumstances are children who nonetheless succeed and they thrive. And we should look at what are the mechanisms that cause that. And also understanding that bringing into the lives of adolescent children, some disadvantaged children who may not have had early family lives, giving them stimulation, giving them mentoring and guidance can play a huge role in promoting their next chance, the generation, or how they can do in the, next, uh, in the future. So these, these are important skills, and I want to talk about this lesson as well. Um, and this then takes me to what the mechanism is that causes this to be successful. And this is, again, something that's very intuitive. I mean, nothing I'm saying. I mean, this is the thing that maybe this is like the king without clothes here. I'm bringing, saying, telling you things you already know, and I think we all know. But they're not part of public policy, and they're not part of the discussion of public policy, and you won't see Many congressmen, senators, representatives talking about this <clears throat> in an open way. And so I want to show you some evidence that these parent-child, mentor-child reaction, interactions play an extraordinarily important role. And what I want to argue is that the universal ingredient of all successful interventions, parenting, school, families, was what I would call scaffolding. It's staying with the child. It's the person intervening with the child. It's a person sort of Understanding where the child is at, taking the child to the next step, but not pushing it too far, too fast, and not, not boring it either. So this role of monitoring, parenting, mentoring, whatever you want to call it, I think that's the universal ingredient of all successful interventions. And I think if we understand this knowledge, that what we understand is that we can actually sign that what's fair can be economically efficient without this efficiency trade-off. Okay, so then I want to talk about pre-distribution and how we can build this case of capabilities. So how do we do this? How can we build the case, base of capabilities? Well, I want to talk about the contrast between this notion about giving people a set of skills. And this is a very basic, very intuitive idea. You see this in Aristotle. You see this in many religious teachings uh, about trying to teach people capabilities, self-discipline, the capacity to develop moral, ethical, and uh, I would argue uh, character skills more generally. So, but let me talk about what the traditional approach is to social problems. The traditional approach is to be very fragmented. So we say we have crime, we should put more police on the beat. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of fragmented solutions. So want more, we want to reduce crime, we hire policemen. It turns out, as a matter of fact, that if we ask just on a cost-effective basis, which is, more, which is more cost effective? To hire more police to reduce a certain level of crime? or to actually get more high school graduates who actually then will not produce that crime, not commit the crime. It turns out that creating more high school graduates is 10 times more effective. It's 10 times cheaper. So just to train students to get them to graduate high school. So just on a pure cost effective basis. But, but fragmented solutions are everywhere. We think about, we solve, instead of looking at core sources of problems, what we do is we focus on trying to solve the problem after it occurred. So we think, if you want to reduce obesity, you basically have behavioral promotion programs. If you want to promote health, you have more doctors and medical facilities. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I want to suggest is there's a complementary and unified approach where we can build capabilities, where people can avoid 
becoming criminals in the first place. They can actually avoid certain problems with their health. They can actually take greater control over their own lives and actually then uh, lay out. And, and this strategy then is based on prevention. <clears throat> now as an economist I have to say there is a good reason why we sometimes wait for a problem to occur. I mean there's this, uh, you know, this adage, you know, the squeaky, should the squeaky wheel get all the grease? There really is an issue. There really is a non-trivial issue. Why, you know, we don't want to start giving people chemotherapy when they're three years old to prevent them from getting cancer, right? In fact, it would probably kill them. I mean, so we, we don't want to start preventing, curing problems before they occur. But on the other hand, there really is a sense that prevention can be far more effective, especially when we find that the early years, if we don't treat these problems, it can be much more cost, costly to actually cre treat those problems after they've occurred. And so in that sense, I, even though I recognize the wisdom in this adage, I also think there's other wisdom, which is that the early years and the years of school, the years when children are still uh, malleable and flexible, play a very important role in a way that hasn't been recognized yet in social strategy and social policy. So let me just talk about the, these cognitive and character skills. So what am I talking about? Now we know a lot of work has been done on looking at cognitive tests. So we have a lot of work on SAT scores, achievement tests, IQ scores. But we also know, and there's a lot of work in personality psychology, a lot of work in, by economists now, psychologists, and many people, and a lot of intuitive understanding that skills like motivation, sociability, attention, self-regulation, self-esteem, the ability to defer gratification, things that are called virtues and other evidence, these are actually very effective in promoting economic and social productivity and integrating and creating a society of dignified human beings. And I want to suggest that even, these are not just sentiments. These are actually sentiments that have very hard empirical evidence that can enter the public policy domain that insists on empirical evidence. And so I think, uh, I, and I want to show you just a little bit of this evidence, which I think in some sense may be very intuitive. But this is data that comes from a study that was done uh, by myself and a couple of students a few, quite a few years ago now, where we're basically looking at individuals. So what, this is a, a measure of, have you ever been in jail at age 30, which is some measure of criminal activity. And what it does is it's a graph, and this is the, it shows you the probability of being in jail. But it looks at various people in the deciles of the cognitive and non-cognitive distribution. So for example, the, non, the cognitive distribution, the relationship between IQ and crime, that's been well documented. Hernstein and Wilson and others talked a lot about that 20, 25 years ago. So children who are generally lower in terms of intelligence and measures of cognition, they're the ones who typically are more likely to get in trouble with the law. But what we also did on the same graph is say, what about measures of character skills? Now this is a very crude measure. It's putting together all different measures of these character skills. It's a scalar measure, should be vector. But, and there is our vector measures, but I, it's too complex, just too complicated to go through all these. But what you can see is these character skills also have a very sharp gradient. Those children are highly motivated, self-disciplined, they learn self-respect, play a very important it plays a very important role. This is a strong empirical association. If you look at the same relationship for pregnancy out of wedlock for teenage girls, it's really for teenage girls, it's not labeled as such, we find that both cognitive and non-cognitive skills have the same effect. Those at the higher level of the distribution are the ones who are less likely to be engaged in, uh, in out of wedlock births and uh, so forth. If you look at who goes to school, for example, who's a college graduate by age 30, we find as you go up the distribution of both of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, both are associated with higher levels of college completion. So these are very important traits. Perfectly sensible, right? More recently, some work by a psychologist at Duke University, named Terry Moffat and her colleagues, have actually looked at this question of self-control, which is one of the virtues that is emphasized, I know, in the Catholic Church, but actually there's hard evidence on it. So we can think of it, it's a classical virtue, it's an Aristotle, it's a Christian virtue, and I'm just giving you the way it's defined in the last bullets on this slide. Acting impulsively without thinking, can't wait his or her turn, frustration and the like. Well, there's a measure now. This again is a study, a longitudinal study of children in New Zealand followed over their whole lifetime. 
lives. These children are now into their early 40s. They were started, at, in this panel, was started when the children were very young. So what was done by these scholars, led by Terry Moffitt, was to ask, what, what are the effects of people? When you look at self-control measures at five and six, uh, what you find is, and you look at things like health, for example, uh, you find, for example, that people with high levels of uh, self-control are much less likely to suffer problems of health in their teen, in their adult years. And if you look at this gradient, I mean, these are just kind of obvious points maybe, but I'll just, I'll go through them. There's similar patterns across many other outcomes. For example, children with low self-control had more substance abuse problems. They had much less wealth when they were adult. They had uh, less planning for the future and they were less likely to participate in uh, those who had high levels of self-control on welfare benefits. And you can look at some of these other graphs to look at things like uh, uh, whether or not their credit rating, something as crass as their credit ratings. Uh, if you look, for example, at uh, criminal convictions, very similar to the figure I put up from the other study. This is a completely separate study. Uh, if you look, for example, at uh, how these children are as parents themselves, how warm and how supportive they are of their own children, we actually see a very strong relationship. So these traits that are set fairly early uh, are playing a pretty important role. And, and if we look at their adolescent years, those children with early skills of self-control and with discipline, self-control, were much less likely to smoke, to drink, and to become unplanned parents. And, to get, uh, and, and the cost of the school system was substantially lower and life satisfaction. Let me just talk very briefly about work that I uh, published in a, in, a, in a recent book, some of which we talked about, The Myth of Achievement Chess, the GD, and the Role of Character in American Life. The GD is a very interesting example of this. I found it very informative. I've looked at this for uh, over many years. We finally published a book on it this year. And what we did is the GD, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an exam that high school dropouts can take to certify that they're equivalents of high school graduates. And just to show you, how successful this is as a test. It's very successful by the standards usually used for tests. So if you look at this graph, this is basically showing, well, look, the GEDs are here, high school graduates are here, the two distributions almost perfectly overlap. And high school dropouts are much lower in terms of cognitive ability. So it really does sort, okay? Now, I tell you that, it looks like a good test. Yet, let me tell you something else that the GEDs, even though they have the same test scores, more or less, the same distribution of test scores as high school graduates, uh, are earning and participating in society like high school dropouts. There's almost no difference. And if we compute, as we did in this book and other studies, we look, for example, at a distribution of these non-cognitive skills, we see that the high school dropouts and the GEDs are basically share the same problem with self-discipline, motivation, and the like. So again, this is the, another piece of evidence supporting the idea that these, these, these skills are very important. So that's, that's kind of body one. That doesn't tell anything how we might do, doesn't give you social policy. It still doesn't answer the genes question, okay? But let me give you another piece of evidence that still doesn't answer the genes question. Not that I'm a big believer in genetics, but I think society still is very strongly attached to that idea, even though modern genetics would oppose that idea. Here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a graph that I found is stunning. And this is basically looking at the test scores of children by the social uh, the educational requirement of the of background of the mother. So you can get, this is a very familiar graph to people who study who goes to college, who doesn't. What we see is that parents, uh, uh, if the mother is a high school graduate, or less than a high school graduate, the kid has a fairly low test score. Uh, if, if you look at the high school, those, the mother's a high school graduate, somewhat higher, the mother's a college graduate, very high. So a very sharp gradient across socioeconomic groups is measured by mother's education. But you'll notice that this gradient, this difference in terms of test scores, and we can follow these children in a reliable way from age three, certainly by age five, that the gaps that are there at age 18 when they're about to go to college are already there about age five before they enter school. So whatever it is is going on, it's even there at age three. Before age three, it's not very reliable. And if we look, for example, at measures of, of, of self-control, this is a measure of antisocial behavior, you get a reverse graph. So the kids on the top, our example, are the kids who come from the 
lowest income distribution, these are the highest distribution, the gaps open up relatively early and they persist and uh, they're suggesting very strong sorting. Something's going on. But the question is how do you interpret this evidence? And as I said already, is it due to genes, which is one of the traditional explanation? Is it due to family environments, neighborhood, community effects, due to parenting or family investment decisions? And I want to argue there's an important role for the latter two categories. But let me give you a fact, something that I think is many people find very titillating. If anybody here is from genetics, you'll find this very boring. This is a nine-year-old picture. So, but nonetheless, most people aren't from genetics. I found this very stimulating. So I want to look at something which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences some nine, uh, nine years ago now. What this is, is a small splice of a gene, of the genome. Now genes do nothing by themselves. Genes have to be, you know, they express themselves. And gene expression is how genes translate themselves into behavior. So our genes do nothing. It's how genes are actually expressed in the behavior. What this shows, and, and this is, I think, very revealing, the differential coloration, these are the pairs of identical twins. These have the same genetic material at birth. All this is showing, is this is different parts of the genome uh, of these various identical twins. These are identical twins who are three-year-olds, and these are 50-year-olds. And the only thing you really have to understand is there's one twin on the left, a different person on the right. They all have the same genes. And the differential coloration essentially is a measure of how different the genes are expressed how much the experience that these two identical twins had impressed on them the gene expression which will then trigger a whole set of behaviors. That's one example that suggests that it isn't, that experience is playing a pretty important role. So these are people, remember, with identical genes. Now, I could explain what the coloration is and how I have time. I'm running low on time as I'm talking too much about the beginning here. But you can see that this differential coloration actually can translate into behavior, into immune behavior, into behavior and criminal behavior, a number of things that have been studied. So that's, that's kind of exhibit A. So here I'm trying to show my evidence on my points. Secondly, let me give you some idea of how much nurture varies across family environments. And I'm, not, I'm staying mostly within the United States. I'm not talking about countries in rural China and India and in Africa where you get severe deprivation. But for example, if we look, for example, at the gradients, the difference, what I referred to earlier, about the difference between how much the child is spoken to. So high level of mother's speech, medium level of mother's speech, and a low level. How much this translates out. This is in months of the age of the child. We can see that already at 26 months, you're getting substantial differences in the vocabularies of children. Now there may be some genetic differences here that aren't accounted for. But maybe another study along the same lines is a study by uh, Hart and Risley done some 20 years ago now, which shows the environments in which these children are growing up in. So children growing up in welfare families, they're actually hearing only 1,600 word, 600 words in an hour, whereas families that are professional families are giving three to four times as many words. So the environments are much richer. And it's not just the number of words, it's the nature of the parenting environment. Harsh environments saying, don't do this, don't do that, versus encouraging, supportive, and warm environments. And this leads to some substantial differences. Again, no causal effects yet, uh, although I'll get to that. Now, what do I mean, wouldn't we talk about family environments? Whoops. Uh, wait. Oh, boy. My big, th this is a, something went wrong here. Uh, one of the slides didn't work. <laughs> well, I don't know what, I can, I, can, I can see it, but you can't. Can you see anything there? No, you can't. Huh. Well, I'll tell you what you should be seeing. Uh, what this is, is it's showing the graph, the percentage of children under 18. The actual, the, the graph that I wanted you to see, I don't know why it didn't come through. I can see it on the screen, but you can't see it here. What we have now is we look at the children under 18 living in single parent households in the United States. What we see now is roughly 30% of all children under 18 are in single parent households. So actually the graph should go up to about here. And the biggest growth sector is this sector here, which you can't see. It just didn't show up. And that's the never married single parent. And in the United States, maybe not in Northern Europe, that's a very extreme condition of disadvantage in terms of those are the welfare families, those are the families most disadvantaged that are least nurturing of the parents. So I apologize for that slide. This is a more 
dramatic example about birth to unmarried children. And it's not just an American phenomenon. You go to Chile, you go to Mexico, you're even finding trends like this around the world in places like Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan even, even though it's at a lower scale. So we get substantial gradients by socioeconomic status. And so the question is, what can we do about it? Now many people have looked at this graph. This is from a former student of mine who uh, is at loggerheads with me on this issue in a very, I think, a very constructive way. I have high regard for him, and that's Lance Lochner. And you'll notice what this graph is showing, and it's quite interesting. It's showing who's going to college in terms of family attendance. And this is as of 1997. So these are kids who were like 18 to 21, say around the age of college, going 17 to, to 20 or so in the United States. And what you see is a pattern that's quite interesting. The pattern is such that uh, smarter kids are going to college, as you might expect. And that's what the AFQT is. It's a measure of ability. But within each ability group, you're finding that income, the children from higher income families are more likely to go to college. That's kind of the pattern that I was showing you earlier, but it refines it. So within ability groups, you find this pattern. And many people have said, well, this actually is due to family income constraint, and that's one of the bases for the Gatsby curve, right, why we should redistribute income. Okay. Well, what I want to argue, though, is that actually, even though we think a lot that income plays an important role, and empirically there's a relationship between family income and college attendance, that income is not the whole story. And I don't even think it's the larger part of the story. I want to argue that skill gaps, not income gaps or tuition costs, are explaining a substantial amount of the gap in college enrollment between majorities and minorities. So let me just give you what I think is a startling figure. This is work that I did with Cameron, uh, uh, Stephen Cameron, many years ago now, where we actually looked at the black-white gap and also the Hispanic-white gap, which has been documented. So we actually, just look at the college proportion, since I'm running low on time. The actual gap in the mid-90s was something like 11 percentage points for the black-white gap and who entered college, any kind of college. And if we look at the ability, and, and we do the same thing for Hispanics, it's 0 0.07. So this suggests a shortfall of about 0 0.11, 0 0.07 percentage points for any kind of college, you know, four-year college, two-year college, whatever. Now, when we adjust for the ability of these individuals at age 18, the gaps turn negative. That's partly affirmative action policies. Kids who actually have the abilities and the motivations can actually succeed, but it turns out that the, the ability base wasn't there. Now, for me to even utter those phrases 40 or 50 years ago would have meant a lynching and so forth because the notion that ability was given by some genetic basis. But we know that those abilities can be shaped, and I'll show you some interventions uh, that show that. But let me give you something that I think is quite interesting. I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that there was a substantial difference in intergenerational mobility between Denmark and the United States. And so I want to look at the comparison uh, between the U.S. and Denmark. And I actually have a, a postdoc who is at the University of Chicago, and we were looking at this. And so remember, Denmark is viewed by many as the ideal welfare state, right? It's got very low income inequality. It's got a very high level of uh, uh, educational support. There's no tuition. There are no tuition costs to go to college. Uh, you have basically uh, even high benefits in terms of uh, subsidies for attendance in the school. And yet if you look at attendance rates, like who graduates high school and who goes to college, what you'll see by the parental gradients, well, you can see there's still a big gradient in college attendance for children whose parents didn't graduate high school. But if you look, for example, in high school and in college background, this is the high school attendance of the mother, or high school attendance, uh, college attendance of the mother, that despite what looks like substantial differences in the welfare state differences, the differences are not all that sharp. Uh, certainly, they're a little sharper in terms of who goes uh, high school attendance. So what's the role of capabilities in explaining the gaps? And so what we do is we do some, a series of comparisons. And since I'm running quite low on time, uh, let me just talk very briefly about it. But what we find when we look at measures of cognitive skills around the time of child going age, the patterns, if you look at US on the left, Denmark on the right, are about the same in US and in, in Denmark, even though the welfare states are fundamentally different. If you look at the importance of family wealth, family income, they seem to be relatively equally important. College attendance, family wealth, 
What we also do is we say, how important is the ability of the child at the time you go to school in determining who goes on, okay? Who completes high school, who goes to college? And there, the curves are almost identical. So ability plays a very important role, whether it's in U.S. or Denmark. And uh, if we look at things like high school completion and all those other graphs I talked about earlier, basically they're equalized. So whatever it is that causes abilities to be different are actually playing a huge role in explaining these gradients across a welfare state where a lot of these tuition costs are not there, where inequality is much lower compared to the U.S. So that's really the equalizing thing. So we have to understand how can we address the ability gaps. Um, so let me talk very briefly. I guess I'm running very low on time, and I want to show you a couple of figures, though, about addressing some of these questions. And what I want to talk about is a couple of interventions uh, that actually have been applied both to human beings and to primates. It may seem I'm stretching it a bit, but primates uh, do actually have a lot of physiology compared to what we have, and I think it's very important. Let me talk about one set of interventions that I've talked a lot about. Uh, Early childhood interventions have been studied now, and they've been studied with experiments. So this gets partly at this genetic argument. So what happens is children from disadvantaged environments, uh, some from a group in uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, fairly close by here, uh, just outside Detroit, another group in uh, Durham, uh, North Carolina, uh, were given intervention early on in their lifetimes. I can't go through all the details, but there, one intervention, the kids were three to four years of age, they're randomly assigned to an intervention program. Um, and what did the intervention do? Basically what it did is it brought kids into school for a few hours, into a school, a center, to a couple of hours a day. It taught the kids each day to plan a task, to, to do a task, and to review the task. They were working with others. They were teaching discipline, showing up on time, cooperating with others. Some groups were randomly assigned to this Others were randomly denied this. We followed these people to age 40. We're actually now, I got so interested in this study that I've actually, uh, I'm now collecting the data on them at age 50. So I, I moved from a dispassionate researcher to a very passionate researcher on this question. We're actually uh, putting data out in the field now following these kids to age 50. Very high follow-up rates, very low attrition from the sample. But what, what happened with this? Well, we followed these kids. And First of all, what we find is that this had substantial effects on many different dimensions. I'll show you what those dimensions are. The fact that they had substantial effects for these kids, all of whom you know, basically were the same randomly at, at the beginning, the same backgrounds in general, is argument against the purely genetic argument. And they were given what was this ingredient, parenting, warmth, and sur sur parental visits. Parents were encouraged. Parents were visited. Uh, there were home visits, and what happened was it changed the nature of the parent-child relationship and the teacher-child. A mentor entered the life of the child, and the parent also became a more powerful mentor. And I'll show you some evidence on that. But the interesting thing is, in terms of this primary way we think about this, is that this program was very effective, but it didn't boost IQ. This is a graph that I think is really very interesting. Initially, the treatment group who were, not, I say, followed for 40 years and were following up to age 50, the treatment group had a big surge in IQ and then it faded. And so by age 10, the treatment and control groups basically had the same IQ. It was exactly that effect that found in Head Start in the 1960s that Arthur Jensen used in his argument about compensatory education. I don't know how many of people remember Jensen's argument, but he said there was a fade out of the IQ of Head Start, which there was after a few years, and therefore it failed. Now, what was Jensen's fallacy? Jensen's fallacy was only looking at IQ. He was not looking at this important dimension of character and social and emotional skills. So fortunately, we, I got associated with this. Uh, we've done an evaluation of this. We've done an economic evaluation. We did a cost-benefit study. We find that there's a statistically significant annual rate of return of 6 to 10% per annum in these kids. Now, that, we, the substantial cost but you're getting money back. So if you're just only interested in the bottom line, you're getting a substantial effect. That's about the same par as the rate of return to the stock market prior to the 2008 meltdown. So it's a very high economic return. And what was the mechanism? These cognitive, non-cognitive, and character skills. These early interventions reduced by changing the 
unhealthy family behaviors by supplementing family life, not by forcing anybody to do anything. There's no compulsion. These are all voluntary programs. You're supplementing the life of the children. You can actually look at things like various measures of personality skills. And you can actually see how, you know, what's called externalizing behavior, the aggression and so forth, substantially reduced among the treatment group, more academic motivation. And something that blows the minds of many people is that even the, non, even the cognitive test, IQ didn't go up, but the cognitive test did. Why? Achievement test. Achievement measures not only how smart you are, but how motivated you are to learn. So the academic motivation is they learn more, they learn more about their field even if they were no smarter in a sense of answering just abstract IQ test. And so we can actually then decompose the treatment effects. These are all statistically significant effects. They survive a whole series of testing procedures uh, so to avoid just picking fortuitously a few hypotheses. And we can actually see that most of the treatment effect operated through changing social and emotional factors and through personal behavior. And that's a consistent finding. Now, I mentioned fragmented solutions. Look at these fragmented, look at what, what here. These, I, initially when Perry was started, was same as, as Head Start, everybody wanted to talk about boosting IQ. Because in the early 1960s, everybody was convinced IQ was the be all, the end all, the measure of the worth of a human being. Now, when you look at the health effects on Perry males at various ages, 27 and 40, we see substantial effects. Less smoking behavior, we can see that, uh, uh, changes in dietary behavior. But more recently, and this I find even more interesting, a related intervention that was done in, uh, in, in, in uh, again, for the same motivation, somewhat more intensive, done in, in Durham some, some 10 years later, again, randomly assigned, people followed to age 35. We actually gave medical exams to the kids at age 35. Remember, these were cognitive exams, but they had the same chemistry. Social and emotional skills, working with the child, mentoring, scaffolding. And look at the results. For anybody here over a certain age, you'll see these are good things uh, indeed. If you know your heart, blood pressure, you can see substantial differences. Look at the systolic blood pressure, 143, above the kind of minimum hypertensive level for the control group and for the treatment group, 125. You can see, for example, substantially less obesity, severe hypertension, the Framingham score, which is a measure of, uh, uh, and so forth. So you actually are finding substantial improvements, which we're currently turning into a measure of. Um, so uh, maybe I should really uh, wind up here. The I, I, I wanted to show you a little bit about some other experiments, but how am I doing on time? I'm at 45 minutes, I think, now. And should I stop soon or 55? Oh, 55. Ah, even worse. OK. So maybe I should just talk very briefly about uh, the rest of this. So we have done similar studies. So how does parenting and nurturing get under the skin? So I've always mentioned this mechanism of parenting. OK. We did some studies. I did some, there's a famous set of studies done many years ago by um, uh, a, a person at, at the University of Wisconsin named Harry Harlow. Harlow's monkeys. Uh, they were rhesus monkeys that were raised outside of Madison. Uh, and uh, he said, gave a number of experiments to them. That whole group of monkeys has moved to NIH, and Steve Sumi, who's there, actually uh, still keeps the monkey colony and regenerates it and so forth. Now, the thing about monkeys, the rhesus monkeys, they have very similar physiology to humans, and you can experiment on them without, we can't experiment on humans. Dr. Mingale is long retired, and so uh, we, we can't really do those kinds of experiments. And besides, I don't think his were very exciting. So what we do, though, is basically take, uh, we take these monkeys and we subject them, not to extreme forms, because they're animal rights even here. But what we can do is we can take them and put them in relatively isolated environments and the more nurturing environments. And without going into all the details, again, you can actually see, this is again the kind of heat map I was showing on the genetic expression. You can actually see that those children who were raised in kind of less than the mother's family, you actually see things that have to do with, with certain parts of the genome associated with inflammation and so forth, uh, uh, and various kinds of health behaviors, which we actually later related to true health behaviors, were affected. So th what happened is that the genome itself, the gene expression, was modified in a lasting way by essentially giving them uh, richer environments. And we could actually measure the physical health and mental health because we had records. We had actually veterinary records on these.
I, I'll just have to skip in the essentials of brevity. The one goal mentoring program that was actually featured by Paul Tuff in his book um, is actually now being evaluated by uh, a graduate student uh, and as partner at the, uh, uh, as co-author at the uh, University of Chicago of Vladimir Zanoni, Tim Couts and Vladimir Zanoni. And this basically is again a mentoring program and its function is to take kids, in this case teenagers, so it's not all early interventions, the early years are the most propitious. Uh, taking mentoring programs and essentially then finding out how those mentoring programs to stay with the child through high school on into college, how well that helps the kids. These are average kids, they're not the bottom of the barrel and you can say who enrolls in four year college and using a variety of experimental, not experimental methods, they actually find strong effects. I'll just have to, uh, there, there are some studies that were done by, uh, recently done by uh, uh, Armin Falk and his co-authors in the form of uh, home, uh, human prosociality, where basically children from disadvantaged families in Germany were actually given mentors and those mentors came with them. These were kids who were basically in uh, high school years and uh, they were actually given um, uh, some mentoring, some guidance and that created uh, a huge, uh, so those who didn't get the mentoring actually show this in terms of measures of prosociality in, 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 elicited by games. These are dictator games, games that, he, that economists and political scientists use. So let me just, uh, I think I should really conclude. You're giving me the hint. I, I don't my sick. You can pull the hook anytime you want. I'm, I, I can talk uh, on under the night and you don't want to do that. Um, but I would say that what we've learned from this, is this is what I have, this is provisional conclusion. These are all, any empirical work is always provisional, so I can't, this is not absolute truth. But what we've seen from a number of these interventions, and not just this Perry program I talked about, not just ABC, is that what was engaged here, what went on, was actually changing the nature of the parent-child relationship, or the mentor-child relationship. That this enhanced what, what child psychologists would call attachment, and engagement of the parents. And I, I really think that when it's all commonsensical, and that's the part that, in some sense, we, we educate ourselves to be idiots, right? We, we think along certain ways, we, get, we think you know, IQ is an important thing, we, we get fixated on certain ideas. But I think these kinds of notions, John Dewey uh, you know, was talking about successful schools do what successful parents do. Uh, I would basically paraphrase this, uh, rephrase it, to successful interventions do what successful parents and successful mentors do. What we're doing is we're adding to the lives of these people some guidance. And I'll just say that we, we went back to these early childhood studies and we say, what are the mechanisms producing the effects? Well, giving children information, even in the adolescent years, plays a very powerful role. That's been very well documented. Uh, you can also change the way parents perceive themselves, what they can do with their, and how important their role is. They don't fully understand it sometimes. And you can also change parental response uh, and to the child's curiosity. But one thing we did do, and again, this is something we found that hadn't been analyzed before, is we can actually, in a lot of these interventions, we have three or four of these now, where we actually can see the nature of the change parenting relationship between parent and child. And we see substantial improvements in those. I, I won't be able to go through all those. But let me just make uh, 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 one final point. Uh, and you can keep, you can stop me at any moment, I'll stop. But, I think what we really want to understand about poverty is that it's not about money. It's not all about money. It's not strictly about money. There were studies done in the Chicago projects, the Robert Taylor homes, which have since been torn down. And everybody, and there were studies done by anthropologists and ethnographers and many people, not just economists, but they, they all point in the same direction. That children growing up in the most gang infested, dangerous neighborhoods, a lot of those kids became successful middle class people. And what was the, what was the ingredient? The, in, the ingredient was the notion of the conscientiousness, self-control, the discipline that the mother, that the parent and the environment provided. Whether it was church, whether it was family, neighborhood. It didn't even single parent families. So it wasn't the case that it was just, so there really was an important role for this notion about, you know, again, this sounds very soft and fuzzy, but we've quantified this and we can actually see that they really are. So we, we're just beginning to understand this. The dynamics of skill formation, I've talked about the fact that non-cognitive skills, uh, these, these skills enhance each other. Literally, we have uh, some work that I've done with Flavio Cunha where we find that people who are more highly motivated, people with higher levels of social and emotional skill, 
they work harder at school. They pay attention more, they're easier to teach. These, they also, healthier kids are also better. Kids with asthma are gonna have, Janet Curry has found that in several important studies. Uh, cognitive skills produce better health practices, but there's this synergism which has been neglected in public policy, which came partly neglected because we bifurcated. We just put into corners, into silos, these different, and these skills basically mutually reinforce each other. And I would just offer this is to think about a framework of, of development over the lifetime leading to all these different outcomes, but also more basically than saying we're getting higher earnings or higher health, it's promoting the dignity of the human being, agency and creating an individual who is, uh, so I, I'd better uh, uh, wrap up and just to say uh, that, you know, the, the, the diagram is basically through some notion of, uh, of what, what's called complementarity or synergisms. Uh, but this notion of critical and sensitive periods is really, uh, I think, uh, is very important. So let me, let me just conclude with, uh, and, and there's work that we can be done, as I mentioned, in terms of adolescent interventions. Uh, we know that the prefrontal cortex, which controls a lot of emotion, self-regulation, is maturing on into the teenage and young adult years. So we know that's an avenue. And so that even though we think that IQ may be relatively fixed at a younger age, by the time kids uh, are, are 17 or 18, it's not too late. There are plenty of successful interventions, but we think differently. We think much more about mentoring and so forth. So uh, let me just conclude uh, by saying uh, let me just, oh yeah, as saying that thinking of the child as an emergent system, you want to get me off this, uh, okay. Thinking of the child as an emergent system, and uh, let me just uh, lead with something. So I won't go through promoting education, which is also an important way. So I'm going to argue that the true measure of disadvantage is the quality of parenting. I think that's it. And all of these strategies are ways to improve parenting. Parenting broadly defined, okay? That's point one. And I want to think about pre-distribution, not just redistribution. I really am the conclusion, and I'll conclude with this, this graph, which basically I, I think is, is a very important graph, but it has to be well understood. And this graph is basically suggesting that if we're at the beginning of the life of a child, at the beginning, and we ask where would the first dollar be best spent, it's in the early years. That we know. That's not to say we can't make very substantial returns, but part of the benefit of investing early is that it makes it so much easier to invest and it gives the child so much agency and so much opportunity down the rest of one's life. That's the logic of this. It's, this is not what economists would call an equilibrium relationship and it's not a relationship that's gonna, there are plenty of high quality investments in kids are, you can get a 20% rate of return on college education for a bright, highly motivated kid. But if the very beginning of life plays a very important role, and it's part of what social policy is typically neglected. So with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got carried away. Sorry. Should I stay here? Or? Oh, oh, Joe. Okay, fine. Uh, the beauty of this conference is the fact that it brings so many disciplines together on a topic. The beauty of Jim's talk is that it illustrates the breadth of economics, and uh, hopefully that's a good advertisement for our discipline, for the, people, the undergraduates in the uh, audience. Uh, our discussant for tonight, who's going to talk only a few minute, moments, is uh, going to be Joe Kowalski. Uh, Joe is the David and Aaron Seng Foundation Professor in the Department of Economics uh, at Notre Dame. He joined the department in 2010, having spent the early part of his career at Ohio State. His research focuses primarily on growth and development uh, in international economics. His works appeared in the top journals in our profession. In 2012, he was awarded the prestigious Frisch Medal, awarded biannually for the best paper in the journal Econometrica over the past five years. There may be no better academic in the university at using his research to support the Catholic mission of Notre Dame. Joe is the founder of Credo, the Catholic Research Economics Discussion Organization, He's a consultant to the USCCB, uh, and he has been the chief evaluator on Catholic Relief Services Silk Savings Program in East Africa. Uh, at Notre Dame, Joe teaches an undergraduate class in the economics uh, in Catholic social teaching, and for the past five years, he has organized an academic conference for Cardinal George and the Lumen Christi Foundation on economics and Catholic social teaching. 
Uh, Joe and his wife, Juhi, live in Granger with their four kids. In his free time, Joe has four kids. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he also has an unhealthy allegiance to Wisconsin professional sports teams. So uh, without further ado, my colleague, Joe Kowalski. Uh, thanks. Um, given the time, my discussion might end up being uh, shorter than my introduction. Um, it's a little bit awkward. It's awkward to discuss a Nobel Prize winner's uh, paper. It's particularly awkward when this Nobel Prize winner was your dissertation advisor. Um, it, there's no sort of um, insider game here. Jim's work has always been very different than mine. The, the reason I, I wanted him as an advisor was you could see the passion that he had in his work and the important questions he always addressed and the rigorous methods he used. And so that's... Uh, you know, it wasn't that we don't, we've never worked on the same uh, materials. Um, that sort of explains why I wanted him to be my advisor, but you know, as economists, we know there's both demand and supply. Um, on the supply side, uh, basically Jim was the only guy that was worth, you know, willing to, to take me as a student. I appreciate for that for, for, uh, for him. Uh, there was a rumor at the time that he had um, shown a lack of self-control in a, in a department meeting, and so it was a punishment. Uh, to have to be my chair, but I thank him for it. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wanted to give, I knew Jim was going to give a long talk. Um, he's always been great on persistence and conscientiousness, self-control when he's building his slides, not always. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to summarize very briefly the main points of the talk. Inequality is rising in the U.S. and elsewhere. The, the symptoms of inequality, low wages, bad employment, uh, possibilities, low levels of schooling, uh, they stem from low capabilities, and that's something we've established largely. They stem largely from low capabilities. And these capabilities in, involve both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And these non-cognitive skills, I think Jim might have even used the word, I put virtues. You can think of them as, as that's how I think of them, virtues. Although they're, they're secular, uh, you know, natural virtues, things like sociability, teamwork, conscientiousness, persistence, impulse control. Um, two pages of summary. Uh, these skills are not purely genetic. They're in fact, they can be, be developed by families, schools, and importantly, intervention programs. Skills beget skills. So both non-cognitive and non-cognitive skills uh, build on existing skills and build on an important foundation. For that reason, the young ages of a person's development is particular are particularly important. And then the last one, I had to introduce at least a little bit of math into an economist's talk, so I have the greater than. And Jim's going to say that pre-distribution, not that redistribution is necessarily bad, but that pre-distribution is better than redistribution in terms of being a win-win, possible win-win for everybody and having bigger impacts when you do it when they're young than if you try to have programs for adults. Um, okay, so that's the summary. This is a quote from Pope Francis on poverty. Obviously, poverty is a big part of the Catholic faith. This is from his Evangelii Gaudium. And he says, welfare projects should be considered merely temporary responses. He says, as long as the problems of the poor radically resolved, and then he says some stuff about markets and finance that causes Rush Limbaugh to call him a Marxist. <laughs> I'll pass over that briefly. But then he says, by attacking the structural causes of inequality, so we have to solve problems of the poor by attacking the structural causes of inequality, not through welfare projects that are at most a temporary response. Okay? And then the last thing he says is that inequality is the root of all social ills. Now, the pope is not a social scientist. The pope is a pastor who's concerned for his flock and for the world in general. And he's putting poverty as an important problem that needs to be solved. And the last statement, inequality is the root of social ills. I guess the question is, what type of inequality is the root of social ills? This is related closely to the Catholic idea of integral human development. First of all, the emphasis on inequality that Jim, Jim's talk had, the Pope is talking about, is related. There's two dimensions to integral human development. One is the development of the whole of society, so all peoples. And inequality is obviously important here. And so the, the focus on marginalized people, inequality, is, is very um, in sync with the idea of integral human development. The second is the development of the whole person. 
and meeting the person's needs and growing in both the physical dimension, the psychological and cognitive dimension, social, emotional, and the spiritual dimension. In Jim's work, it's not clearly addressing the spiritual, but it is taking a fuller picture of human development than is typically taken by an economist, okay? So, so the, the, the thrust of this paper seems to be largely in line with uh, the idea of integral human development. Okay, when I think of views of poverty, I mentioned the Pope has this idea of uh, inequality being the root of social ills. So one view of poverty is that the inequality stems from material poverty. And we see that poor people also, there's a lot of other social problems associated with poverty, obesity, crime, etc. One idea is that material poverty causes social problems. My wife is a social worker, and I think that's the standard approach that um, social workers take. An alternative view of poverty, which is one that, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but this is one that, that Jim is, is um, pushing, is that the lack of personal development, so it's inequality in capabilities, both cognitive and non-cognitive, uh, both, you know, the lack of inequality in virtues, perhaps, leads to both material poverty and other social problems. And so the reason that we see other social problems correlated with material poverty is because they have a, a root cause, a common cause for both of them. This isn't a question, I mean, I know not, not everyone's an economist here. This isn't a question that's about ideology. The second alternative is not, some, and I think Jim's talk expressed that, it's not something about blaming the poor. It's not an idea that the poor are, are their own fault, you know, they're poor because of their own fault. That's not the idea, but the idea is to get a realistic, uh, to truly understand the realities that poor people face in the world in order to be, better address them, okay? This causation matters, and it matters if you wanna help poor people. I'll give you a, an example. This is not my work. This is another work from the literature. The U.S. has both high rates of obesity and high rates of hunger. And we hear statistics quoted at the same time. It's an odd thing. We have high rates of obesity and high rates of hunger. What's even more striking is that those, it's in the exact same populations. The poor populations in the United States have high rates of obesity at the same time that they go hungry many days out of the year. They don't eat or they're, they're undernourished. So what's an approach? What approach, approach that we take is a policy approach, is food stamps. And in fact, I just had a bishop write a, a, a letter for the, the, our Credo newsletter arguing about that we shouldn't be cutting food stamps because they're, they're going to the most vulnerable and hunger is a moral issue. I agree uh, on that. Um, but what do we know about food stamps? So economists have shown that basically food stamps, this is surprising to almost anyone that's not an economist, food stamps have no impact on food consumption or the likelihood of going hungry. And how can that be if you give people food stamps that they don't spend more on food? Well, the idea is that if you have $150 a month in food stamps and you were already spending $400 a month on food, that $150 that you got, you can spend on whatever. You just take $150 less that you were spending, use the food stamps, and the rest of the money you can spend on whatever you want. And that's exactly what we find. So food, food stamps are, are not uh, associated with food consumption. Um, what, what else do we find? Well, the way food stamps are dispersed is they're dispersed monthly. You get your food stamps at the beginning of the month and you have to budget over the course of the month. And we find using diaries of what people consume following people that what happens is at the beginning of the month when they get their food stamps, they consume a lot of, of food. At the end of the month, they don't have any food and so they go hungry. What does that lead to? Well, obesity is a very long-term process. It matters what the average consumption over a long period of time. Other health measures are, uh, you know, for young children, going hungry is still a, a big health problem. What, what's the reason for this? It's that the recipients lack self-control. So this is a, a deficit of a, a type of uh, self-discipline among that population. Um, they, can't, they can't manage the budget. So what does this say? The delivery, this doesn't say, well, we shouldn't have food stamps, but it says that you know, increasing the amount you give at the beginning of the month may have no effect, but instead, giving it to them on a weekly basis, which is technologically feasible now, you just earn, get the transfer on a card, could have important effects. So I'm giving this example to, to emphasize sort of what the role of economics is and why it's very important if you're truly concerned about poverty, 
to not be ideological about your approach to it, and to study things um, hard using data. Uh, a lot of Jim's work, there's an emphasis on the family. It is largely a, a pro-family proposal, and I think you saw that. I'm already out of time, huh? Okay. Um, but Catholic social thought is all about relationships. If you want to summarize Catholic social thought, there's a three-pronged way. Relationship to God, your relationship to other people, and your relationship to the rest of creation. And so the, the, I think there's, there's nothing at odds with what Jim said with Catholic social thought, but it doesn't go the full way necessarily. I think how an economist would view it is that strong families lead to the, lead to the development of virtues, leads to higher income, and higher income's an end good, and so we put yay, okay? <laughs> I didn't have a, a good way of expressing the Catholic view, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's something like the church would say virtues, yay. Family, <laughs> yay. So if you think that relationship itself is the ultimate goal, then the family itself is, is, is how you would evaluate things. And the idea that families lead to temporal goods and virtues lead to temporal goods isn't because the temporal goods are the most important, but that's a way of us discerning that virtues and family are important, okay? And income is valued in Catholic social thought, in the history of Catholic social thought, largely as a means rather than an end. Potentially a means to furthering human relationships, but certainly a means to um, the practice of virtue. That's a St. Thomas Aquinas for you. So then this question is, the economists, Largely, I mean, Jim has this new view of, of poverty. It's, it, it, it's, it's very different than sort of what we've thought about poverty. Oh, I have two mics going on, don't I? Uh, what we thought about poverty at the same time. And it's the idea that this, we have to look at the fuller person, not just test scores, not just income, to think about um, human flourishing. And that's something that, of course, the church has promoted for a long time, and the church has promoted the importance of virtues, as Jim said, in Catholic schools. Um, maybe that means that you know, the church was right the whole time. And so uh, I think there is a couple lessons. I, mean, I think the church does have some wisdom to offer secular fields on this front. Um, but I don't think our approach should be one of, of triumphalism, which means we don't really need the social sciences because we, already, we understood the human person. The church says we're, they're an expert in the, in the human person. That doesn't mean they're an expert in the social sciences. I think it's very important to stay in contact with social sciences. Jim said it at the end, this evidence is, is great. A lot of it is correlation. I mean, I, I believe it, but a lot of it's correlation. The causation we have is based on small samples. There's a lot of research to be done. Implementing the programs would require a lot of uh, research. So I think there's much to learn, much to evaluate, and much to discuss. I think it's great that if the church stays into contact with economists, other social scientists. This is a multidisciplinary conference, a multidisciplinary talk. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of our speakers. This represents the very best of what we're trying to do here at the, at the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, which is to take the highest learning and the highest aptitude for for various disciplines and engage them directly with the Catholic social tradition. So thank you both to Jim and to Joe. Please give a round of applause to both of our...